accounting firm that Redemption has used for so many years that has done such a phenomenal job um, helping me keep the I's dotted and the T's crossed and making sure that two plus two actually does equal four. So uh, they do just a phenomenal job and I'll introduce them to you in just a moment. And then we have uh, Asiatico firm is also represented here. Uh, we hooked up with these folks, oh my goodness, probably 15 years ago, I guess. And they handle just about every area of, uh, of law that you can imagine from simple licensing and um, different things like that to taxes, um, accountings and all kind of different stuff. Don't even know all the terminology, but we have a representative from them too. So I just wanted to kind of give a general thank you for being here, we're excited. Again, this is trying times. Uh, all of these folks were instrumental for us, Redemption, to go ahead and we've already submitted uh, every piece of paper and looked at every single spreadsheet over the course of the last three to four days going into last week. And uh, we're, we're thankful to say that we've gotten everything submitted uh, in the CARES Act, the PPP and the EDL, which is what we wanna go over. By no means am I an expert. Uh, Jen Mahoney, my assistant, who's also on this call, she and um, Salmon Sims Thomas and Asiatico worked countless hours. I'm, I'm not even sure if I could even keep up with the amount of hours that they worked to get our applications through. And uh, so we wanted to pull this panel together for you uh, to be able to help assist you answer questions um, that you may have from nonprofits to church, whatever it may be. And I think we've got the panel here to do that. So. As Ashley said, without any further ado, let me introduce who we have. This is our accounting firm. And if you'll just kind of wave uh, as I call your name, we have Bill Sims, who is the CEO and managing partner of Salmon Sims Thomas. We have Miss Emily Cook, uh, partner with uh, Salmon Sims Thomas, and Miss Donna Snedek, senior manager. <clears throat> Thank you so much for being here. And again, I know I've told you probably 10 or 15 times already. Thank you for what you did for redemption and uh, getting all of our information submitted. And uh, we, we thank you so much for that. Also from Asiatico Law Firm, we have Vess Som. Vess, if you just kind of wave at everybody. Uh, Vess is the staff tax attorney. So he'll be able to answer any questions uh, that have, pertains to that. Again, for anybody who's on here, I think pretty much everybody knows who I am. I am Greg Smith. I'm the executive pastor and CFO of Redemption Church, uh, Ron Carpenter Ministries, Hope Carpenter Ministries, and it goes on and on as we have about 11 entities. So it's good to be with you uh, here today. Also, we have, you've already met Miss Ashley, I've introduced her, and then I have Miss Jen Mahoney, who's not only my executive assistant, but also director of operations for Redemption. And uh, I'm probably going to have even Jen to uh, chime in here uh, if she, uh, you know, if there's a question that she can help answer. She was very instrumental in, again, getting redemption um, already submitted for the PPP and for the EDL. So before I turn it over to Miss Emily, um, there's one thing that I'm going to change. I'm not sure if you've seen the, uh, the itinerary or the agenda for today. There's one thing I want to change up a little bit. We had question and answers available at the end of going over each topic. I think what we'll do now <clears throat> is we will have question and answer uh, after each topic. For example, I think we're going to discuss the CARES Act and the PPP together, which is the payroll protection plan. The payroll protection plan really is under the umbrella of the CARES Act, but I'm going to ask Ms. Emily maybe just kind of give an overview, if you will, Ms. Emily, of the CARES Act and then pull into the PPP. And we can kind of knock out both of those topics at the same time. And then once she is finished, uh, we'll open it up for questions and then we'll move into the EDL, uh, which is the um, disaster loan, the uh, emergency disaster loan that's also, <clears throat> excuse me, available <coughs> to, uh, to each and every one of you. So that's kind of my opening statements. I'm gonna turn it over to Miss Emily. And again, thank you so much for being here, Miss Emily, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Pastor Greg, and um, thanks for having us here. Um, I actually did throw together, and let's be very clear, it was thrown together a little PowerPoint, Pastor Greg. So if I can share my screen, it might be easier to follow along. Um, I didn't put too much into it, but I think it has a it does a good job of outlining uh, what we want to talk about today. So let me see if I can share my screen. Let's see. 
Now, Ms. Ashley or Robert Cooyar, if there's anything that the participants need to do to share, if you can just kind of let us know, or if it's just all on Ms. Emily. I'm not um, seeing where I can share. I believe that we have to give her rights real quick, make her a presenter. The right way, or it will uh, it will kick it out. So, Miss Emily, I have got my um, screen up, so it looks like it is uh, is working on my end. Okay, so everybody can can see this. Um, yes. Great. So, um, what I'd like to do is, you know, kind of go over an overview of the CARES Act, which does include the PPP. With, like Pastor Greg said, we can have some questions and then we'll move on through the, the idol. Um, and I'd like this to be as interactive as possible with the other panelists, so please feel free um, to chime in. Um, and also you, Pastor Greg, and uh, Jen as well. So that being said, so the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act, um, first, as we all know, the guidance and interpretation is continually involved, continually evolving. I mean, things are changing day to day. So what we're saying today, while we think it's close to being final, we can, um, there could be changes still. Um, we did discuss that the payroll protection program is a part of this loan, and we'll get into those details um, earlier. The expansion of the EIDL is also a part of this, and again, we'll get into that um, later as well. Other areas of this act include, you know, the business tax relief, um, employee retention credits, payroll tax deferral, and also individual relief um, via tax rebates, additional unemployment benefits, student loan forgiveness, um, and also modified rules for distribution from qualified benefit plans. Um, we're not going to focus on all that today. I think that's a lot, but um, the PPP and the EIDL um, we'll try to go into in a bit more detail. So the payroll protection program, um, the PPP, is basically it's assistance for small businesses, certain nonprofits, 501c3s and 501c19s, veteran organizations, sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self-employed individuals. Uh, nonprofits and small businesses were able to start the application process on April 3rd. Um, other uh, individuals, contractors, and sole proprietors will be able to do that on April 10th. This program is administered by SBA financial institutions, so think of your banks. Uh, what we're seeing now is that while the application process is open, a lot of banks do not um, have what they need in place to really start this process. Um, some um, are not SBA approved and they're working to get to be approved. Others just don't have the infrastructure ready to start processing the applications. Emily, I, let me jump in. I, I would say, Greg, as you were saying that you guys have already submitted your application, consider yourselves fortunate because there are a lot of people that are, have not, and it's not for lack of trying, it's really just the infrastructure, as Emily said, the banks are, are struggling with this to get up to speed. I mean, it's like, unlike most pieces of legislation, you get months, if not a year plus, to figure them out. This thing is, everybody's learning it on the fly, including these institutions, and so it's a, it's a challenge for them, and I, and it, from a not to get political, but it's going to it's going to make a difference as to how all this stuff, how long it takes for all this stuff to really, you know, get down to the to to us, the public, the the society, as to you know how this works. But I mean, you guys have submitted your application. Sounds like it's gone through, and and from people that we've talked to, that once that happens, the money gets there pretty quickly. But it's just a matter of getting it to that to that point. And we're finding the more we talk to banks is um, different banks require different information. So what one bank might want, um, another bank might want something different. You know, eventually, hopefully, we'll get some continuity between, um, you know, amongst all the institutions. But right now, we're just, I think everyone's just doing the best they can. So. Um, yeah, if I can jump in here, the um, just to piggyback off of, um, um, bill, a big part of the de delay is because of the um, the interest rate. 
in in drafting the legislation, four percent was really uh, um, uh, uh, thrown around, and it's actually embedded in the CARES Act. And then big banks such as Wells Fargo and Bank of America and other uh, qualified SBA lenders, they were um, thinking about you know the the point the zero point five percent that were um, published in the PPP information sheet from the Treasury uh, um, Department, and they realized they couldn't make any money. So they had to, and I'm looking at your bullet points in regards to the 1%, and that's, that's how it was, um, that's part of the delay. But even with that delay, Wells Fargo just recently published um, on their website that they're not taking any more um, SBA applications for the PPP loan because they've already capped off on the amount that they've, um, they've had. I bring that up is because even though there was a little bit of a delay for some of the institutions, it's vitally imperative for us to, to communicate with um, the nonprofit community that this is available to them, but they have to get on it as soon as possible because um, there's only a certain amount of funds. It's, sure, $350 billion from the 2.2 trillion is allocated for this but if you're thinking about all the um not just nonprofits but small business owners including sole proprietors that the cares act includes those funds will run out pretty soon absolutely absolutely um so thank you thank you for that insight um <laughs> When we're looking at the forgivable portion of the loan and how to calculate your maximum loan amount, um, I've outlined here uh, how you do that and, and what the allowable costs are on what you can spend them on. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later as well. Emily, um, let, me, let me interrupt you for one, one small item. Everybody please. probably everybody probably knows this, but there is a limitation of 500 employees for each company. I don't think I see that, but it is, there's a limit. So I don't know if that applies to anybody. I suspect not on this webinar, but just be aware of that. Sure, thank you. And under the PPP, as well as the idle, which we'll see later is um, some of the low payments are deferred. In the PPP's um, case, it's six months. In the idle's case, it's um, a year. And under the PPP, there's no collateral or guarantees um, at this time. Um, and as Bess said, the interest rate is 1%. That's interesting how they came up with that. I, I wasn't aware of that. So that's, that's interesting. Um, and if a portion of the loan is not forgiven, the maturity is, again, two years at 1%. So next steps, you know, again, this is kind of loose because, you know, some banks are ready, some aren't, some, as you mentioned, Best Wells Fargo isn't taking any more applications at this time. Um, so as a broad overview, you know, you need to see if you're el eligible, find a bank, um, calculate the maximum loan amount, um, complete the application including the borrower certification i think they're leaning heavily and you guys please weigh in on you know the good faith certification of the borrowers that what they're saying is true they're loosening up what they're actually confirming um, and really relying on that certification and then gather the supporting documentation as we mentioned it does change from bank to bank right now but hopefully we'll gain some more clarity and consistency on that and then track the forgivable expenses. I think that's a really important part because in order to have your loan forgiven, you're really gonna have to make sure you can identify and show support that you spent these funds uh, within eight weeks on allowable costs. Um, and allowable costs, I know we've probably heard this several times, but it's payroll costs, employer paid benefits, um, utilities, retirement, um, mortgage interest and um that's kind of the allowable cost if you look at it from what can be forgiven does anybody have anything on that to chime in 
It also includes rent. You said mortgage interest. It's not the principal, but the mortgage interest. But if you're leasing your facility, the rent counts towards that, towards that amount that's forgiven. But there is, a, are you going to get to Emily about the 75% needs to be payroll related? I thought I had that in there. I don't know if I do, but yes, 75% does need to be payroll related. Um, Yes, Emily, go back over those qualifying um, things again. Mortgages, rents, utilities, just mention so, those again. Okay, so there's if we, we can look at them in two buckets. You look at what you want to calculate your maximum loan amount on, which is the amount of the loan you're eligible for, and then what you can use that money for once it's funded. So the maximum loan amount is two and a half times the average monthly payroll up to 10 million. And so once you have this amount, then you have eight weeks to spend that on utilities, rent, mortgage interest, and payroll costs. So let me interrupt, Emily. So at a high, high level, when they were, presumably whoever wrote this, the goal is everybody I think knows, the goal is to, to, to incent employers to keep their people on the payroll rather than letting them go, furloughing them, whatever, it's to keep them on the payroll. And so the calculation is really based upon what payroll, I mean, they define the term, what costs are included in the payroll, which is then multiplied by 2.5. You, you come up with a monthly amount, you multiply, basically you get two and a half months is what they're funding of the, of the payroll then they say you've got to use 75% of that on payroll, but you can use it the other 25% some overhead related items is basically the concept. Is that, hopefully that makes sense. Vess, anything to add to that? Yeah, I th thank you, Bill. J just to clarify that a little bit further, if you are going to just use the, what you call qualified payroll costs, and that is, the what you would include to for for calculating the maximum amount of the loan which is compensation to employees those are of course your your salary and wages and that also could include uh, benefits such as um, vacation sick time and, and leave of absence with with group health insurance um, also, you should include, because there's only very few states that do not have state income taxes. And so you could also include state and local taxes that are assessed to employees. For that calculation, you would times that 2.5 or 250%, and of course that will become your, um, the amount that you would, you would be able to, to qualify to apply. But as uh, Bill uh, uh, noted, the qualification to apply for the loan is different of how, how much could be forgiven on, in, in regards to how you use the loan. And so if you use the loan for, for, for those purposes of, of how you, you, you uh, um, applied for it, mainly just because the purposes of legislation for keeping employees or keeping staff and, and paying them for the next um, eight weeks under uh, um, what you're, 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 you're applying for, then 100% is going to be forgiven. However, you can use it for uh, uh, rent expenses. You can use it for mortgage interest payments. You can use it for um, utilities. But those costs, as, as Bill said, you don't, only 25%, up to 25% could be forgiven under the loan. Anything above that, you would have to pay back. One of the things that, in terms of the components that go into the loan amount, the calculation of the loan amount, there was a lot of discussion from the date that the law was signed, which was, I think, the 27th of March, until last Friday when they, they started taking applications, the SBA started taking applications. There was some question and there was a lot of discussion amongst a lot of us about, you know, what's included. You know, can you include the FICA taxes and the Medicare taxes? Can you include, you know, particularly relevant for this group, what did housing, you know, if you were paying housing allowance, is that included? Because as we all know, that's not in, it's not considered 
taxable in for it's not taxable for income tax purposes for the ministers so it's not on a w-2 at least in the whatever box that is it's federal taxable wages so is that included you know there was a question a very there's a lot of uncertainty about independent contractors payments to them by the church is can you include that as part of the payroll number so over the the ensuing two weeks those areas were clarified and basically the answers were that I don't know if they addressed housing allowance. I don't ever remember seeing anything specifically, but in my mind, housing allowance is compensation. It just not happens to not be taxable at the income, you know, federal tax uh, level, but it's still income, so that's included. But the FICA, you know, taxes are not included. The um, payments to independent contractors are not included in that. So there's, um, they clarified that, and then as best there is, you can see a bullet here. They limit a hundred to a hundred thousand dollars per employee and that's on an annual basis. I mean, then and there's health insurance premiums, retirement benefits, and as Beth said, state and local taxes that the that the employer pays. So again, it's it, 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 the concept is okay, what is the employer paying for in the way of people cost? And the government is in trying to incent them to keep those people on the payroll. And so that's why the calculation is geared around payroll and related benefits. And one thing to chime in on the $100,000 limit, I did just see, I think it came out last night or earlier yesterday, that even if you are capped at the $100,000 for your salary, you can still include the benefits for that person in the max calculation, the max loan calculation. Um, so I know there was some, it wasn't so to, say that, to say that differently, Emily, or maybe use an example. So if somebody's paid 120,000 and they have benefits paid by the employer, by the church of $12,000. So since the math is easy to do, so there, there's a limitation of 100,000 on the compensation, but there's not a limitation down to 10,000, the 10 twelfths of the compensation on the on the insurance benefits, the twelve thousand is still allowable to put into the calculation. Correct. Yes. Yep. So when I was talking to Pastor Greg and uh, Jen and Donna earlier today, um, he mentioned wanting to kind of look at the application and just kind of go over portions of it. And so I do have snippets on these slides um, that we can go over briefly, and then you know once we um, kind of complete the PPP section, we can go back and address specific questions um, if, if we want to do that. Let's see. So the PPP application is actually pretty short. Um, the, the first part of it um, is basically identifying your organization, name, um, things of that nature, contact information. The average monthly payroll we talked about calculating you know, you can look at all of 2019 payroll costs, or you can look at the 12 months preceding when you apply for the loan. Um, then you'll multiply that average monthly payroll cost by 2.5, and you'll come out with your uh, maximum loan amount. This also wants you to have number of employees, and um, guys, please chime in on this. It's my understanding that that's a head count. That's not a full-time equivalent. That's what I understand. Yeah, that's my understanding also. Okay, so if you had five, two full-time employees and five part-time employees or four part-time employees, you would still have six or seven employees versus the full-time equivalent. Um, purpose of the loan, you know, I typically, when, when I've looked at them, I've not limited my, ourselves, and so I pretty much um, checked all of that apply there. Applicant ownership, this is a little different from nonprofits because technically nonprofits don't have owners. Um, and so when you put an owner name, we don't, I haven't put owner names in there. Bill or Bess, have y'all said seen anything on that? No. You mean the other owner? I mean, since nonprofits I, don't have owners, I just oh, leave right. that blank. Yeah, I, I think I think part of, of that um of that question really comes down to something that 
both you and, and Bill have um, touched on, which is the 500 or less employees. So say for instance, um, this isn't just applicable to, to for-profits. Some nonprofits also have subsidiaries or they may be, um, or they may own what you call a, a for-profit subsidiary and whatnot. And so you have to aggregate the, the number of employees together. That, I think that's really what, what the heart of that question goes into. And let me just chime in here. We had one of our RMFI pastors, uh, there I go calling the RMFI. It was RMFI for so many years, now it's RF. So Redemption Fellowship pastors that just chimed in on the chat and said that he left that portion blank, the applicant ownership left it blank, and he uh, was approved and already funded by not putting anything in there. Right. Well, that's probably back on the first page. You've got to make sure you check the box up at the top that says you're a 501c3 so that they know to not look for a name here. Absolutely. Right. You know, these are additional questions, um, you know, about the applicant, about being a, a felon, things of that nature. That doesn't, I hope, doesn't really apply here. And more certifications and authorizations. This is the part of the application that really they're asking you to give good faith certification. Um, and the next slide shows it a little bit better of, you know, that you're eligible and that you need these funds. So that's all I have so far on the PPP, guys, do y'all have anything you want to expand on? Are there additional questions? There, there is a signature page at the end that requires a couple of signatures. And I assume, Greg, it might be interesting to ask your, your group, but particularly, particularly the ones that have submitted this thing and particularly the ones that have been approved. I mean, I assume they still had to sign, even though they didn't have the owners in that section, they still had to sign as a representative and somebody else. My question is really, what what level people sign that application? Would it? I assume it would be, you know, it, some staff level person, executive mm -hmm. pastor, somebody signing that thing. And then my other question is, is there some board person signature that's on there, or was it another staff person? What was? What did what did you guys do? After discussion, we, um, I, I'm on the board. Um, we felt like someone that was on the board, but again, with my position as CFO uh, and executive pastor, we felt I would be the one that signed those, uh, the application. Jen can chime in, because Jen, as you know, I kind of stepped out at the end there. Um, am I still correct, Jen, on that my signature was the one that went on there? That is correct. I saw somebody chime in, in the chat that said that they did a sh quick board meeting to authorize signature, which is a great idea. Absolutely. And I will note that a, that a lot of the banks that I've seen are requiring, you know, either a driver's license, a social security card, and personal information on the person who's actually signing and certifying um, the application. Pastor Greg, did you see that or? I'm sorry, Ms. Emily, ask that again. I apologize. So what I've seen is the person who's actually signing it and providing the certification of it, they're asking them for their social security card, their driver's license, you know, personal contact information um, as well. Jen, can you chime yes. in on that? Absolutely. Um, Emily, those questions were asked um, on the application, the, the driver's license, the form of identification, um, you know, the social security number. You didn't have to provide actual cards or identification, but you did have to provide the numbers. So let me, um, let me ask one of the first questions, and I think there was actually another question or two, and I think Ms. Ashley or Ms. Jen's going to present those questions. Let me ask this, and, and this may be a broad question. So a lot of the folks that are on here are senior pastors and or churches, they're associate pastors, whatever it may be. What if we have a nonprofit that either is on here today or that views this tomorrow, which is what we're going to do is put this out there for uh, kind of for the world to see, so to speak, uh, or even just a small business? Is the application the same? Um, 
the type of information that they're asking uh, for for income like we had to do is that basically the same from just a small business or a nonprofit that may not be a church my understanding Pastor Greg, is that it's the same application. I, I mean, again, the differentiation is probably at the very top with those right. six, half dozen, whatever boxes that kind of differentiate those entities, but the bulk of them are going to be for-profit businesses, and that's the underlying assumption, if you don't check a box, is that you're a for-profit business that meet the criteria of less than 500 employees. Fantastic. Good. That was a question that had actually been texted to me multiple times when they realized we were going to be doing this. So I wanted to, to address that. And then Ashley, Miss Jen, whichever one wants to take, I think I saw a question or two come across that had to do with this, uh, with this section of the uh, presentation. Yes, um, one question that we got, Pastor Greg, was, um, so if we don't have payroll but only rent and utilities, do we qualify? Well, first of all, praise God, you have no mortgage or rent payment. And tell me how you did that. We kind of have to, might need to have another seminar to tell us. But praise God. What was the question that they only have payroll? They do not have payroll, but have rent and utilities. Um, Beth, you might have to think differently. I don't see how they would qualify because the loan amount is calculated based upon payroll. The usage of it is payroll and then the overhead, but the calculation originally is based upon payroll, so I don't see how you can borrow anything. Yeah, I, I, I second that. Um, also, if you just want to get a little bit deeper into the weeds of the intention of legislation, it really is to retain payroll during this um, pandemic that we're having. So mm -hmm. uh, um, you're using the payroll, of course, as Bill said, to calculate the loan. The, uh, um, utilities and rent or what you're what you're referring to those things you can use for the loan but to qualify for it they're not actually included in the calculation of it. I hope that clarifies it great 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 answer is that um miss Jen any other questions if not we're going to move on to the uh, next section uh, that we've got about 20 minutes which is kind of what we thought is there um i didn't see any other ones come in no more questions pastor greg but i just want to add a little tip based on experience um, for all those who haven't filled out the application yet i strongly suggest um, reading the instructions and gathering all the required documents ahead of time it'll certainly save everyone a lot of time as they go through the application and then the second tip I have is um, when you're filling the application out, if you have to walk away from your computer or laptop or iPad, whatever you're using for any reason, make sure to use the feature that says save <laughs> because um, it, it, the application will time out. Absolutely. I learned that button a long time ago with playing <laughs> Xbox video games. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so let's move, uh, let's move on to the EIDL um, section, if there's no other questions. And um, Ms. Emily, I'm not sure if you're taking that one as well. Um, sure, I can start, but again, you guys uh, feel free to chime in. This slide just shows a summary um, of the EIDL, uh, which is, it's, the eligibility is similar to the PPP, but this is actually administered directly by the SBA. This is not through your bank. Um, it's an expansion of um, other loan opportunities, but the requirements um, have been scaled down significantly. Uh, it provides for non-forgivable. Uh, it's not forgivable, but it's a loan for up to $2 million for working capital. Um, I mentioned earlier that the loan payments are automatically deferred for one year. Um, it's at a very low interest rate um, over up to 30 years of a term. One of the things I think is really important is when you apply, if you apply through um, the SBA for an EIDL, you can, apparently there's a box you can check for the $10,000. Um, it's an advance, they were calling it an advance and now they're calling right. it a grant for working capital that you can get within three days is what they're saying now. If you get 
if you even if you don't if you can get the grant without being funded through an idol um, later if you do get PPP funds you will um, reduce that PPP forgiveness amount by that ten thousand dollars you receive for the grant um, and then if you get an idol before you get the PPP funds that loan can be rolled into the PPP fund um, is that you guys have that's a brief overview but do you guys have any additional comments on that go ahead this yeah I, I think that's a good overall summary of of the EIDL it is I mean there are a couple of criteria if I remember I have not spent as much time on this one although I've seen some some email traffic about for, for some another consultant another accountant talk we were talking he was saying that hey you ought to get all of your clients to apply for this 10,000 I mean yeah it's not this it's not nearly as big typically at 10,000 but it's like again it's it's when well, you say free money, I mean, nothing's free, but I mean, it's, it is a grant. It doesn't have to be repaid. The rest of this, if you were to get an EIDL, it is a, it, you have to repay it. There are some terms. The other thing that kind of make a point about this particular loan is, although I think it probably applies to most people, but, but there are a couple of criteria. One being that your revenues have dropped 50% from what they were for a period, same period of time. I can't remember exactly what that I means a three month period or something, maybe two month period. Anyway, they've dropped significantly this year versus last year. And then the other component was you've been put via government, been put under some kind of shelter in place or whatever. So that applies to most of us. So I think that that second requirement is going to let everybody in the door, so to speak, to make the application for this, for this particular loan. You'll if back on the PPP, at the very top of that application, it does, as Emily was saying, it does kind of, it asks you how much you're applying for with the PPP, the amount of your month average monthly payroll times 2.5 plus the EIDL number. What they're doing is they're basically saying that this one, as it says here, this one's limited to 2 million and the EIDL is, or the PPP is limited to 10 million, they're not going to give you 12 if you apply for both. There's a limit of 10. And so they roll it in, they factor it in. I don't know that anybody in this call is going to be at that level, but just understand that there is a, there is an interplay between these two. Yeah. And, and unlike the PPP loan, um, whenever you get into the higher amounts of the EIDL, um, it's just like a regular um, type of underwriting for a loan in regards to like collateral and personal guarantees. So that's that's a stark difference between you know the PPP and the EIDL. And just like Bill said, in in, in regards to certain purposes of what you can use the EIDL for, um, if they basically they they can't necessarily overlap with the PPP. So PPP, from the, the, the title of, of the actual loan itself, is, is really a protection for, for employees' paycheck. So, um, so you can use it for other purposes. I mean, I guess maybe, maybe the question that was asked a moment ago about, hey, I don't have any payroll, but I have rent. Maybe this one is the one to apply for rather than the payroll protection maybe all right miss jen um wonderful job guys wonderful and ladies uh for this uh insightful information uh i'm sitting here looking at my chat button so you've done such a wonderful job um that there are no questions at this mm -hmm. point uh, we'll stay here if there's any kind of finishing thoughts um, and then Miss Ashley I think uh, we were gonna let you kind of close it out but um, so if you've got some questions don't be shy throw them out there real quick again we're gonna be putting this out there tomorrow maybe even this evening um, this was to our active membership of our Redemption Fellowship but we've got a huge list of what we call our inactive um, and uh, so we will uh, 
out there and I'm sure there'll be many more questions. We'll come up with a format or a process on how to answer that questions. But let me, before I turn it over to Miss Ashley and I see the chat button going off now, so maybe there are some questions. But before we get to those, let me again, just personally thank uh, Bill and Miss Emily, Miss Donna, Bess, thank you for being here and uh, taking your time uh, to uh, give this knowledge and uh, this expert uh, information if you will, to uh, to these folks. I know it's much appreciated. And uh, Miss Ashley, Miss Jim, I'll let you uh, come back and see if there's any questions at this point. Okay. May I add one thing? Please. Yes. Um, as I I just recently visited Simon Sims Thomas's website, and they have a good COVID nineteen link that you can visit. And of course, they're the experts in accounting and and in that type of sources. We at Asia Article also have the link for COVID-19. You can go to that at BAA Legal, B as in boy, aalegal.com, and you can click at the COVID-19. So please do use all your free resources mm. because I think both Salma Sims Thomas as well as our firm, we're a legal firm, they're an accounting firm, are trying to do the best that we can do for um, to help nonprofits and, and really just facilitating everything that we can for them during this, this pandemic period. But importantly, a lot of organizations, both for-profits and non-profits, but particularly for tax-exempt organizations, um, if they're able to apply for this, and most of them will be able to, for certain you know, types of, of loans that actually turn into a grant, um, we really want them to take advantage of it because a lot of the rules out there um, are actually put a lot of you know tax exempt organizations in disadvantaged you know positions um, in, in how they run their 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 organizations compared to for profits. But um, please take uh, um, advantage of the uses of both Simon Sims Thomas's uh, uh, website as well as ours for you know COVID nineteen languages and provisions. Excuse me. Thank you, Bess. And actually, after this, um, our meeting is over, um, we're going to be sending out links to both websites. So thank you for that information. It does have a lot of helpful um, sources and links on, on both websites. Yeah, and again, you can, um, it just went away, but you could see the uh, information too that uh, Miss Emily had put up there. So again, thank you for that. Anything at this time that we can share with our folks, uh, let's, let's uh, be sure to do that. Uh, Miss Ashley or Miss uh, Jen, was there any additional questions that came in uh, there at the end? No, sir. Well, I'm going to turn it back over to Miss Ashley if she will close this out. Again, thank you uh, again for our expert panel. Thank you for being here. Um, and uh, again, for all of our RF members and pastors, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to, again, good to see your your face, or even just as I'm reading the names here, um, uh, really appreciate you joining us. Hope this information is helpful. Uh, if there's any additional questions or struggles or anything that you have once we sign off, uh, please be sure <clears throat> excuse me, to reach out, and I'm sure Ms. Ashley's going to uh, give you some information on how we can do that. But we're here to serve you, and that's Pastor Ron and Hope's heart. When he found out that we were doing this and uh, the content we were going to be sharing, he was absolutely elated. Uh, he called me again at about 1130 uh, my time last night and was just, again, saying how thankful he was that we had put this together. And uh, so, again, thank you for all of you that are here. And uh, Miss Ashley, I will turn it over to you. Yes, yes, yes. Well, thanks again to all of our speakers. You guys have been amazing. And for those of you who are not our members and not on our distribution list, if you'll fill out that link I just posted in chat, um, that'll capture your name and email. We want to get some feedback from you, but that'll also give me your email so I can make sure that the recording of this video as well as the handouts come straight to your inbox. Um, and also just wanted to remind all of our members, we do have our next webinar coming up this coming Wednesday. Pastor Tabner Smith is going to be sharing um, about leading during a crisis, and he's got some great information he's going to share with all of us. Um, but yeah, make sure you fill out that form, and we will get that information um, as soon as we can pull all these PowerPoints and recordings together. We'll put it in your inbox. 
So thanks again. If there's no other questions, thanks for joining us. We're praying for you guys. We're believing for great things and um, just thankful. Don't hesitate to reach out. My num my email is Ashley B at myredemption.cc. And please let me know if there's any way we can help you um, in any way during this time. We love you guys. Love y'all. God bless you. Thank right. you so much Bye, for being here. Guys. Thank you. Bye.